continue uh, our teaching in, um, you know, in the series, Grow. And I am continuing from what I did on the 9th of July, Grow Your Armory. Grow Your Armory, part two. Grow Your Armory, part two. Uh, and this one, I'm actually beginning to go into the weapons. What the weapons will do for you to give you the victory, amen. But we will go through just, just a, a small revision, you know, from what I presented so that we can then move on. This morning, I'm going to deal with the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Because it's the blood of the lamb that makes us who we are today. So let's go, th let's, our key scriptures, again, is uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses eight, 10 to 18. I'll just read the portion. Put on the war armor of God, uh, verse 11. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly place. But I will jump to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because um, I want to counter that. Um, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 10. Verse 4, which says that for the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh and blood, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. Another version just says, for our, the weapons of our warfare are not flesh and blood, but they are mighty through God. Amen, to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, they destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, our key verse today then is uh, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, which simply says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Amen. You can go ahead and take your seats. And we just briefly run through um, the presentation, the introduction, if I may call it that, which I did on the 9th of July. Slide number two, uh, we are in a war, whether you like it or not, amen? There is a war that is being waged against you as you sit there this morning. There are some meetings being held somewhere where people are deciding what, you sh what should happen to you, how they would want to kill you, how they would want to destroy your strategy. So there is a war, whether you like it or not, whether you are tall, you are short, you are handsome, but there is a war that is being waged against you, amen. And the war can be declared. Those that are, you know, uh, 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 they are strong enough, they will bring the war to you and declare the war. But most of the wars that we fight are not declared. They are like cold, Wars, Amen. So they are being fought. You don't know about it, but they are being fought. They, they were not declared, so you don't know, but they are being fought. Amen. And then, number three, I said that the war, that war is not necessarily from the external, from your enemy. This war could be within yourself. Romans chapter 7, verse 23 but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is, which is in my members. So within your own body, there could be war. This part of the body is fighting the other 
and they will not agree to pull to, you know, together to do the same thing. This one is saying, ah, Handidi. Uh, that one is saying, ah, I think I'm willing to do, and there is that fight. Amen. But this one is what really uh, 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 hit me hard. Then war broke in heaven. Revelation chapter, chapter 12 from verse 7 to 10. In heaven, whichever way you want to look at it, heaven is supposed to be a place of peace. Uh, it's supposed to be a place of comfort where you can say, mm, I think I have fought the war. I fought the good fight of faith. Now I can rest, you know. But even there in your place of rest, there was a war in heaven. Amen. The next uh, slide. The types of wars could be is between good and evil, between light and darkness. Could be a war for dominance. Somebody wants to dominate you. A system wants to dominate other systems. You know, the lion is called the king of the jungle. The lion lives by dominating other animals. Amen? And even within lions themselves, there is always a dominating lion, a male lion, which is the, the owner, if I may put it that, the owner of a pride. But for that lion to take over a pride, he has to fight whoever was in charge of that pride and take over. And lions will fight to the death to take over a pride. Because in that pride, there's everything. The females are there. The lionesses are the hunters. So food is provided. The male lion doesn't do much except reproduction and sleeping in the sun all the day. <laughs> because supper is going to be provided. The lionesses will do that. But you know, and, and you know the lion, what it, when it takes over a pride, it then marks its own territory. And it says, here, no further. You stay there. And you know this, the precious liquid that it uses to mark its own territory? I hope you do. Amen. <laughs> It marks it, and any lion coming close will know that, mm, don't go in there. But at the end of that lion's life, some other lion will also rise and fight that one and take over the pride, the life of dominance. We fight for the control of resources, of our gold and our silver, and our, our lithium, and our diamonds. There is fight for that. Why? Because people haven't come to realize, as a guy says in chapter 2, verse 8, that the gold is mine and the silver is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Because they haven't realized that all you are, you are supposed to be just a good steward of the finances of God. Amen. Now, the things that would usher you into your miracle, slide number four, is number one, that will usher you into a war, sorry. It usher you immediately into a war. Number one, your miracle. It will do. Pastor Ned mentioned Lazarus having been raised from the dead. Chapter 12 of John. And immediately, they, these people have planned to kill Jesus, but they also want to kill Lazarus. When others are rejoicing that this man has been raised from the dead, some are saying we have to kill the testimony. Number two, your salvation. The moment that you gave your heart to the Lord, you became a soldier in his armies. You were automatically ushered into a war zone. Amen? And then your anointing. When you are anointed, anointing falls on you, you can ask David. You know, in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, he's anointed. He's just, a, he's just a shepherd boy who probably didn't understand what that anointing meant in, 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 in chapter 16 of, of 1, King, 1 Samuel. But in, in, in chapter 17, David is already fighting. He's already fighting the, the armies that, I mean, Goliath and, and, and the Philistines. So your anointing will, you know, automatically usher you into a war zone. Amen. Now, but this is the thing that you have to continue to, to remember. In other words, what you need to know 
is that even though there are these wars, but you have got a God who is faithful. A God who can fight the wars for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to announce to you that the God that we serve is a man of war. He is a man of war. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. He, your God is a man of war. He is the Lord of hosts. So he will stand there for you and he will do everything that you want. Amen. And you must remember that in that army, God himself equips you with the weapons, which we read Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10. He fights the battle, you know, himself. God himself will do Exodus 14, 13. You know, Moses is, 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 is looking at, he's telling the people, they have crossed the Red, the, the Red Sea, and, and, and the people are afraid because the Egyptians are right there. And Moses says, you know, you don't have to worry. These Egyptians that you see today, you will never see them again in your life. Amen? Because God does the fighting for you. Then the most precious thing is that he hands you the victory. The victory. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 4, and, and, and Romans 8, 37. Now, um, armory as a way of definition is that place, safe place, where weapons are kept. A place where arms and military equipment are kept. And I got just the one synonym of, of armory is arsenal. Your arsenal. Amen. Now, we list, I listed the, the, the weapons. Uh, let's just go through them again. Number one, righteousness. Number two, truth. Gospel of peace. Faith. Salvation. The word of God. Prayer and fasting. And then I added a few more. Declarations or decrees. Confessions. The blood of Jesus or the blood of the Lamb. The word of your testimony. And praise and worship. Those are the weapons that I listed. Amen. Now, what you have to remember, uh, slide number eight, is that you, the, those weapons are not flesh and blood. They are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. And I said the word carnal there is, is, is Spanish for meat, you know, because if you think of meat, you think of the earthly things. Amen. And then... Um, Characteristics of the weapons, again, you know, the weapons are mighty through God. If you think of David's experience in 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 17, you know, he had just a little castling, you know, with five little stones. But when, Dave, when David faced Goliath, and Goliath was mocking him and saying, am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? And, 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 and David, you know, upgraded his equipment, the sling that he had, upgraded it to be a weapon that is mighty. And he said, I come before you by the power of the God that I serve. He automatically upgraded his weapon into a mighty weapon that God was going to use to kill the giant. And I, and I said that, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that, you know, this giant has got that helmet. You know, he sword somebody to, to hold his, his shield for him. If you, if you read that, it was so heavy. But still, God, you know, fought this thing for David, that David with a little sling and a little stone, that stone pierced right into the brain of the Philistines. So the, our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Amen. How to use the weapons? Uh, I said that you can use it as a single weapon. For example, righteousness. If you look at Job chapter 1, the Bible simply says there was a man called Job. He was upright. He feared God, shunned evil. He was upright. And, 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 and again, I mentioned this, and Pastor Tinashe mentioned, mentioned it on, 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 on Friday night, that Job, you know, he was afraid that because his children were having fun. He was afraid that in, in them having fun, there might be you know, actually maligning the word of God. And Job would take a sacrifice and go and sacrifice and say, Lord, just in case my children could be doing something wrong. And, and he offered that because he was right, a righteous man. So that righteousness is a weapon that you can use on its own. And I also mentioned, uh, you know, as a combination of weapons, for example, prayer and fasting, 
We, have just, we are just coming out of prayer and fasting. And I hope that, you know, at, you know, as we go forward, people will begin to look at the miracles that God has given them. People begin to count the wars that they've been fighting, but God has given them vi the victory. Because your prayer and fasting, there is something that God was doing in the atmosphere that would make you a winner, a, you know, in that war. Amen? So we hope we have testimonies of, you know, during that fasting and prayer pre period, God delivered this thing to me. Because your prayer and fasting are weapons that you can use to fight your enemies. Amen? Number two, you can use the blood of the lamb, which I'm going to do, and the word of your testimony as, as, as a combination. Number, number three, uh, prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. You can use them as three because they complement each other. Or when it is really bad, when it is really bad, then you can use, you can put on the full armor of God. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, here's where we start today. We are looking at the weapons. Now we'll look at the individual weapons. The first one that I'm going to do today is the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Now, <clears throat> the title of the Lamb of God you know, it, 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 it actually was given to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But it started from way back in the Old Testament. It was foretold in the Old Testament by Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 19. And Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. As the coming of someone who would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. That's where it started, the Lamb of God. And in fact, the entire sacrificial system established by God in the Old Testament prepares the way for Jesus' coming to save the world as the Lamb of God. For example, in Exodus chapter 29, verses 28 to 42, a lamb was sacrificed for the sins of the people every morning and every evening in Jerusalem. This is where the Lamb of God started. So the Lamb then represents Christ as both suffering and triumphant. As both suffering and being triumphant. So typically, the Lamb is an, a sacrificial animal symbolizing gentleness, innocence, and purity. So in the New Testament then, John chapter 1, verse 29 and verse 36, John the Baptist introduces Jesus or points out to Jesus, and he says, the lamb, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And it appears again, John, uh, the same John chapter 1, verse 36, referring to Jesus as the perfect and the ultimate sacrifice for sin. So when we talk about the blood of the lamb, we are talking about the blood of Jesus because he is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, I want to take you through how the lamb of God will fight wars for you on many fronts. How the lamb of God will fight wars for you from many fronts. Number one, is that the Lamb of God, the, the blood of Jesus, rather, the blood of Jesus, how it fights for you at every level. Number one, the blood of Jesus gives us redemption. Salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin according to the richness of his grace. So the blood of Jesus, the moment that you give your life to him, you are washed, you are Im immediately immersed into the blood of Jesus, and you are washed. 
You know, it's like taking uh, your suit to the dry cleaners. And the suit wasn't looking very good because, ish, you know, you, you've been with it through the mud, through everything, and you take it to the dry cleaners, and they will wash it, they will clean it, whichever way they do. When you go back there, you have got it on a hanger, and it's covered in cloth. When you open it, it's so good to look at because it's just like in you. That's what the blood of Jesus does to you when you give your life to Christ. Amen. It washes you white as wool or as snow. So it doesn't matter how bad your past has been. It doesn't matter what you have gone through. It doesn't matter, you know, the challenges that you have faced. There are stories, you know, there are horror stories of people's lives that you don't want even to listen to them. It doesn't matter what they have gone through. The thing is that the moment that you give your life to Christ, you are immersed into the blood of Jesus and you are washed white as wool. So everything that was in you is now going to be decontaminated and he will produce a pure you. So the blood of Jesus has been shed for you and me. And therefore we must continue, you know, to, to remember that that blood, precious as it was, you know, it's for me. It's, it's for you. It's that, you know, I can live close to Christ. So his blood has set us free from the curse of the law, which are death, sin, Sickness, disease, poverty, lack, depression. That's, you know, it's, it's like you are just being renewed. You are, you are becoming a brand new person. If you were feeling weak in your body, it's like you are repaired. You know, it's like a car coming out of the panel beaters, or let me use the, a brand new car where they take all the parts from wherever they, wherever they keep them, they begin to bring them together and they begin to build a car. And at the end of it, it's a brand new car. That's what you will become yeah. when the blood of Jesus has been poured on you because it's, it gives us redemption. In fact, let me say that the blood of Jesus is the perfect gift that you can ever want. That's the blood of Jesus, redemption through his blood. So when Jesus, you know, was, was harassed and harangued, you know, you know, before they put him on the cross, Pastor Ned said when they beat him proper, and he, he had lacerations on his body, blood coming, you know, oozing out of every part of his body. Ladies and gentlemen, that blood which, 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 which he lost in that process is being set aside for you. That blood was for you. So that blood was actually not lost. It's working its way on the ground. It's looking for those that want to turn to Christ because his blood will give you redemption. Number two, the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, it gives us fellowship with God. It gives us, or it, it, it ushers us into a fellowship with God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, it ushers you into a friendship with God. Fellowship means closeness to God. It means a friendship with God. Now, when you become a friend of God, it means you will have every proximity, you know, to him to do anything that you want to do for as long as it is in accordance with, 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 with his laws. So a friendship with God is important. We used to sing, I'm a friend of God some, some years ago. A friendship is an important thing because when you want something that is, uh, could be expensive or could be 
um, you know, something that is so important, you go to a friend. Because some people will not just give you what you are looking for. You know, the Bible says that in Luke chapter 11, verse 2, 8, Jesus is talking. He says, a friend goes to a friend at night. And he says, you know what? I, I, I've got a visitor at my house. We, he, this friend had also another friend who came to him and said, you know, my friend, I have got nothing at home. Is, that, is there anything that you can give me? This friend then got up and went to the other friend. And he said to him, my friend, can you help me with some bread and something to eat? And Jesus was saying, suppose that friend would say, you know, I'm already, it's already after hours, uh, I'm in bed now, my children are sleeping, and you know, I can do that, maybe I can help you in the morning. But he said, but because of the friendship that they had, this man was going to wake up and say, good bread, I am going to give you. Because a friend, ladies and gentlemen, will do something that other people will not do for you. Amen. Friendship or fellowship with God. God had friends. God himself had friends. One of his friends was Abraham. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8 and James chapter 2 verse 23. He was a friend of God. He would talk to Abraham. Another friend that God had was Moses. Moses was a friend of God. Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. And, and, and Moses would go up the mountain, you know, to get instructions from God, and they would converse as friends would do because he had fellowship with God. And Moses took this friendship seriously because he then said to God, Lord, you know, you call me your friend. But I have never seen your face or your glory. I've never seen it, but we, we are friends. In my own interpretation, interpretation God said, mm, <laughs> But because you are my friend, <laughs> but because you are my friend, this is what I will do for you. You can't see my glory and then leave you will die. But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to hide you behind a rock. Yes. And then I will pass by and, 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 and shield you from seeing my face. And then through a crevice or a crack in the rock, as I pass by, I will allow you to see my back. In my own thinking, Moses must have hit heaven. Because he saw something that other people didn't see in God. Because of a friendship. God said, because you are my friend, I will do this thing for you. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. He beat death, ladies and gentlemen. Because in these wars, what the intention is to kill you so that you will never be, your, you know, your influence will never be experienced again. But Lazarus beat death because he was a friend of Jesus. In John chapter 11, the disciples say, uh, uh, you know, Jesus, your, your Lord, your, your friend is sick. He's sick. Are we not going now? Jesus says, ah, no, don't worry. We will go later. And when he got there and called Lazarus from the grave, Lazarus came out. Why? Because he was a friend of Jesus. So having fellowship with God comes through the blood of the Lamb. So you can stand, sit there, and be able to say, blood of the Lamb, please usher me into a fellowship with God. And that's why in John chapter 12, that they decided to kill Lazarus as well. The plot was there to kill him. Why? Because they didn't want that testimony that he rose from the dead. He beat death because of being a friend of Jesus to be known all over the world. Because people were celebrating. And they were saying, God has visited us because Lazarus has come out of the grave. People were, were dancing, they were ululating, they were singing because of a friendship that Jesus had with Lazarus. Amen. Number three, there is healing in the blood. Yes. There is healing through the blood of Jesus. 
Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. It simply says, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. By his stripes we are healed. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the blood of Jesus will do wonders for you. Healing, he bore mental stress for our worry, for our care, for our sorrow, for our fear. And he went through torment because of our sins, because of his blood. Amen. He suffered physical pain for our sickness and disease. Yes. But by his stripes and his blood yes. that he shed before and on the cross, we can confess healing today. So don't be shy of talking about the blood of Jesus. If you go through, you are praying for somebody, a lot of you visit friends and, and even colleagues in hospital, begin to speak the blood of Jesus. Begin to declare that by his stripes you are healed. Begin to strengthen them and let them know that there is that blood and that blood will do a miracle for them. Amen. By his stripes we are healed. I mean, there are diseases which are very complex sometimes. The doctors are in the house. I have seen um, a, per a certain person having a cough but could not be diagnosed what the cause of the cough was. Could not be. I mean, Dr. Danzo is right here. They've come across complicated issues in, in, in people because sometimes those diseases, they are not flesh and blood. Those diseases are not carnal. They are spiritual diseases. You can't fight anything spiritual by prescribing a carnal weapon. That's why when we go to see the doctors and they give us the tablets and things because they have seen what we are suffering from, it's right there. And they give you the tablets, you take your, your, your dosage and you, are, you, you, you recover and you're fine because it is there. But some diseases that the doctors will be perplexed by them is because they are not flesh and blood. Sometimes it's a spell that has been put on somebody. Sometimes a word spoken against someone that you will never be able to bear children and that word sticks Sometimes it's words that, you know, you are told you will never have money and that word sticks and you wonder everything that you do in your business, everything just falls apart because it is a spiritual thing. And what you need is the blood of Jesus. Begin to, to, begin to speak it. Begin to say the blood of Jesus is against you. Whatever is in this, I'm, um, you know, speaking the blood of Jesus and releasing it because it will be able to, to destroy, you know, what is causing that problem. I, I have heard witnesses of doctors who said that, you know, we go to this operating table and realize that, you know, the thing we are dealing with, <laughs> we don't even know it. And we prayed. But this patient was going to die. Doctors. You can ask him. And we prayed. And when we prayed, then God began to give us a strategy. Yes. This is the way you do it. This is the way you do it. And they do that. The patient recovers completely because of the blood of the Lamb. Yes. Don't be shy of the blood of Jesus. Don't be shy. It's a weapon of war. And it is not carnal. You will take it into the battlefield and you'll be surprised how you have won your wars. You need to carry that weapon with you. Number four, protection. Protection through the blood of Jesus. Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. Protection through the blood of Jesus. This is the Passover. You know the story. This is the Passover. God is going to do the 10th and last plague on Egypt. 
Because Egypt, so far, they've said, ah, these little uh, punishments and things, ah, they don't really matter. But God says, I'm going to do a big one this time. God calls Moses. Moses, this, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill all the firstborn of Egypt, man and beast. I'm going to kill them tonight. And then God says, what I want you to do is to prepare every family of Israel, prepare a lamb. Kill it. Take that blood and put it on, the, on your doors, doorposts and the lintels. Because tonight I will be walking through the land. And when I see the blood, you are protected. And the Israelites did that, killed the God. You know, God, God is... You know, this is a serious thing, but in that, God says, when you have finished putting, smearing the blood on your lamp, your doorposts and things, have a bride. <laughs> huh? Pastor Ned, let's have a bride. Let's just put the blood. Let's just put the blood. And then after that, take the lamb. Let's have a bride. And he said... I don't want any meat left over. So if you had an opportunity to eat as much meat as possible, that was the night. Because he said, in the morning, if there's something left over, just burn it. Just destroy it. Because God was going to do a great thing. And when, they, when God went through that, uh, that land that night, those that didn't have the blood of their lamb on their doorposts, their firstborns were killed, man and beast. Amen. You know, the thing about blood, if I may just digress a little bit, is that blood is not just blood. Uh, blood has got uh, uh, types. Um, it... it, it, it you, you, you don't just get blood when you rock up at the hospital and uh, you've got a low hemoglobin uh, and the doctor says, ah, oh, just run to the blood bank and get blood and, 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 and put, you know, you know, you know, put it into this patient. It, it doesn't happen like that. Blood has got uh, its own uh, blood groups, if I may if I say. And, they, you know, and therefore, if you have to get blood, your blood must be matched with the donor blood. Yeah. That happens in the laboratory where we, you know, they do tests, chemical tests to see if the donor blood is, 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 um, it can match uh, the patient's blood. Then the doctor will say, okay, that's the one I want because it matches. So what happens with blood is that in that laboratory test in the blood bank is that when they do that test, you've got two results. One of the two that will happen. Number one is that that blood could be found to be compatible. It can be taken by the, by the patient, amen? or it is incompatible. It means it is not suitable for that patient. So when the angel of death or God was going through the, the, the land of Egypt on this particular night, God was looking for compatibility. He got to this door and he sees that. He says, oh, compatible, you will live. He goes to the other door, he sees, Ah, oh, the blood is there. This one is compatible with my blood because it's the blood of the lamb. You will live. He gets to this other door and there is nothing on the doorstep. And he says, this one is incompatible. You are going to die. Yeah. Because if a patient is transfused blood which is incompatible, it can kill the patient. So God is looking for that. Are you compatible with my blood? Are you compatible with the blood of the Lamb? If you are, live. You have a life. Enjoy your life because you are in God's hands. But wherever there was no blood, where there was no compatibility, they died in that household. Amen. So he said, you know, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I'll strike all the firstborn in the land. And God did exactly that. That is where the Passover comes from. Amen. Number five, the blood of Jesus gives us authority and victory over the devil. Revelations 12, verse 11. 
and they overcame because there was war in heaven from verse 7. Let me read that. And war broke out in heaven from verse 7. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, verse 11, the weapon that they used to overcome that, the blood of the lamb, and the word of their testimony, and also they were geared to die in that battle. So they didn't count themselves worthy to live, but they gave their lives to fight that. God gave them the blood of Jesus and their testimony, and they overcame the devil. Amen? Amen. So the devil will never stop fighting you. Even if he's got what he wanted from you, if he wanted to kill you know, somebody in your family, or wanted to destroy your business, you know, he will never stop fighting you because that's, that's his nature. The accuser of the brethren, that's who he is. So wars against you will never stop. Don't ever blink and, and say, ah, I think I'm safe now. You are not safe. You are not. Wars will never step, stop you know, if you, if you look at Job again, if I may refer to that verse, I mean, chapter 1 of Job, that when Job was asking, and where have you been? You know, up and down, to and fro. You know, it's like he's just swiling up his time, but you know what? He's got a mission. He's got a mission. And that's why he said, ah, will, ah, will Job curse you for nothing? You know, okay, you know, because you have, you, have, you, have, you have shielded him, you have put a wall around him, which meant that every day of, or every day of his life, the devil would check on Job, just in case there is an opportunity, and I will strike him. So wars will never come to an end. You will continually be in war. Amen? But God has given us a multi-pronged approach to fight the war. Number one, by overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. Number two, overcoming by the word of our testimony. Number three, not to love our lives even when faced with death. You know, Daniel's three friends, they said, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, if it means we will be burned to ashes in that fire, so be it. So be it. We don't love our bodies to an extent that we will kneel and, and worship that calf. No. We are ready to dispense with our bodies, to give them away, to become a testimony to other people. Because somebody will see that and say, but those three boys, if they had died in the fire, they will say they were bored. That becomes a testimony. They will say they were strong. They were fearless. Anything that, you know, they, they wouldn't kneel down on their knees to worship a, 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 you know, a statue, a golden statue. Because God is giving you that victory. And I like uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 10. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but never forsaken, struck down, but never destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest or manifested in our body, or the blood of Jesus itself. So what you are carrying, you know, is the, is the body of Jesus in the form of his blood. So it means your troubles will never come to an end because you carry it. But even when you go through those problems and those challenges, God is always there to give you a strategy to come out of it strong. 
Because the blood of Jesus will give you authority and victory over the devil. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you since we are talking about war. I want to talk to you about a certain war plane called the B-52 bomber. It's a huge airplane. The Americans used that airplane in the Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm, 19, was it 91 somewhere. The B-52 bomber has got a wingspan of about 60 meters. It's uh, propelled by eight engines that are, they are paired, they are put as twin engines under the wing. So there is two, two on that side and two, two on the other side. This is a long range, a heavy bomber capable of flying at subsonic speed at altitudes of up to 50,000 feet. That's 15 kilometers up in the sky. But whilst it is 15 kilometers into the sky, it has got a surveillance system that will spot where the enemy is hiding. This airplane, ladies and gentlemen, can carry up to 32,000 kgs of weapons, including conventional and nuclear weapons, precision-guided munitions, gravity bombs, and a range of maritime weapons. But my point really is that this airplane can carry what they call the monster bomb, which weighs 2,000 kgs, two tons. And when it has gone round, it is spotted where the enemy is because its job is to destroy where the enemy is concentrated, where the troops are concentrated, in their camps, you know, uh, in the bunkers. I, I watch, you know, you, Russia, Ukrainian war, all we see is the Ukrainian side, where they have got these deep bunkers. And they are there, all of them, with their weapons, they can launch rockets from those bunkers. This B-52 bomber has got a, a, a surveillance system that can spot where the troops are concentrated. And also his job is to bomb any strategic sites, you know, to, dis to dis enable the, the, the enemy. Now, what happens is when it drops that 2,000 kg um, a bomb, this thing will hit into the, it actually penetrates into the ground. And then it explodes. When it explodes, it breaks into many pieces, many parts. And these parts could be landing a kilometer away, two kilometers away. But the problem is that if every part is like a cluster bomb, little as it is, it will also explode on its own wherever it lands. Ladies and gentlemen, this, is, this airplane is called the Bunker Buster. But today, I am introducing to you the greatest bunker buster of our time. It's called the blood of Jesus. Whilst this bomb will, will fragment into many pieces, the blood of Jesus is already fragmented in many pieces as he was heading towards the, the cross. He lost blood every little drop of his blood. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a cluster bomb which will explode in the, in the face of the enemy. It will explode when it comes to its, its, its fruition because right now it's hiding in the ground. I mentioned it before, these droplets of blood that Jesus lost, he didn't actually lose. They are waiting for their day to blast the bungers of the enemy. Is the bunker buster of your weapons in your armory. You have to use it. It's probably the best.
best weapon in that armory because it confuses the enemy. It keeps the enemy guessing. It will confuse his strategy. And he would, you know, the enemy is just in disarray. They don't know what to do. If you remember, uh, you know, Elisha and his whatever servant Gehazi, when God confused the enemies of whatever that which were looking for him, in I think it's it's it's, it's second somewhere, sorry, second uh, Kings chapter six, somewhere there. God, the 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 you know the the enemies. Yeah, soldiers were confused that they went back to their own base and they started killing each other without Eli Elisha raising a weapon because the Banga Basa, which is the blood of Jesus, had done its work. And all Elisha had to do with, with his servant Gehazi was to go home and have a good night's sleep. When I, when I was studying this message, you know, I realized that, you know, sometimes we play with the blood of Jesus. We don't recognize what it is. You don't recognize the death that he went through, that man went through. It was for, for moments like this. When it becomes heavy, take with you the bang basta, the blood of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, let me say, God wants you, like I said last time, he wants you to continue to grow your armory. To grow your armory. And I listed uh, three things that you need to do to grow your armory. Number one, enlarging the weapons. Go and purchase your own bangabasta. If the other weapons are not, just go and ask Jesus. He would give it to you. Enlarge your weapons. You know, you can no longer sit there. You know, in war, um, you, you, you know, even when you look at the Russia-Ukrainian war, the West is busy arming Ukraine. You see, they are giving Ukraine weapons that the Ukrainians cannot use. I don't know if you saw that. And they are now busy training the Ukrainian people, soldiers or army, so that they can use those. That's why they say, yes, we can deliver this type of weaponry, but it can only go into service after about six months because they have to take, you know, people for training. But you don't have to wait for that. You must enlarge your armory. You must continuously enlarge your armory. Number two, training ourselves to be ready always. Psalm 144, verse 1. The Lord my God who trains my hands to war and my fingers for battle. It means you must continuously train. Training is good for you. It doesn't matter how old you are. There is always a chance that you will learn new things. Amen. You must modernize them. Modernize your weapons. These days they fight with drones. The other day... Uh, uh, Ukraine sent a, a water drone now. You know, there is a water drone. And, and I'm saying, you know, what is this? Because the drones that I know are flying in the air. They now have a new weapon. So you must modernize them. Like I said, if you are still having bows and arrows, somebody has got a missile. You don't stand a chance. Because you begin to look, ah, uh, you know, the drone has already landed. Before you get to look for, for, for that drone, I mean, the bow and arrow, wherever you thought you had kept them, because weapons like that one, usually they are just put on the side and say, ah, we'll see, we'll see it when it comes. You must modernize your weapon, amen? And you, one of the ways of modernizing your weapons is to replace obsolete equipment. You know, they use interceptors. If you look at the, uh, in Israel, there in the Middle East, when they use Bola and their friends, they, they launch uh, weapons, in, I mean, uh, missiles into, into Israel. And Israel has got this, these interceptors. And sometimes they tell you, we intercepted all of those. None, none of them, you know, you know, was effective because of an interceptor. They would do. So you must modernize, replace obsolete equipment. Amen? 
And the last thing that you have to do when all is done is to stand. Stand therefore. It means to be resolute, to be resilient, to be strong in the Lord. That's what you need to do. The rest of it is God's business. He will fight it. He will hand you the victory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand. Let's stand.